Welcome. This is the January 11th, 2023 morning session of the Portland City Council. Good morning. Please call the roll. Morning. Rubio? Here. Ryan? Here. Gonzalez? Here. Maps? Here. Wheeler? Here. And now we're going to hear from legal counsel on the rules of order and decorum. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Portland City Council. City Council is holding hybrid public meetings with in-person attendance in addition to electronic attendance. If you wish to testify before Council in person or virtually, you must sign up in advance by visiting the Council agenda on the Council Clerk's webpage at www.portland.gov slash Council slash agenda. You may sign up for communications to briefly speak about any subject. You may also sign up for public testimony on resolutions, reports, or the first readings of ordinances. Written testimony may be submitted at cctestimony at portlandoregon.gov. Your testimony should address the matter being considered at the time. When testifying, please state your name for the record. Your address is not necessary. Please disclose if you are a lobbyist. And if you are representing an organization, please identify it. For testifiers joining virtually, please unmute yourself once the council clerk calls your name. The presiding officer preserves order and decorum during city council meetings so everyone can feel welcome, comfortable, respected, and safe. The presiding officer determines the length of testimony. Individuals generally have three minutes to testify unless otherwise stated. A timer will indicate when your time is done. Disruptive conduct such as shouting, refusing to conclude your testimony when your time is up, or interrupting others' testimony or council deliberations will not be allowed. If there are disruptions, a warning will be given that further disruption may result in a person being ejected for the remainder of the meeting. After being ejected, a person who fails to leave the meeting is subject to arrest for trespass. Additionally, council may take a short recess and reconvene virtually. Very good, thank you. First up is communications, item number 20. First individual, please. Request of Nick Christensen to address council regarding the deficit in public services provided to residents of Portland. Good morning, thanks for being here. Technology work in a timely manner. It's one of my favorite questions as well. Thank you. I was not. We, we won't start it till we get it all. Thank you for allowing me to yeah, just try let us to know when you're ready to go. Join the Zoom meeting simultaneously. The idea of PowerPoint via Zoom while talking is both genius and daunting. Let's see here. Zoom is at. Oh, it's a link that's unique to me. We're gonna make this work. I really do apologize for that. I was hoping I was third. Could he forward the presentation maybe to you and there. then? I got it. I, oh, you got it. I got okay, it. good, you're a genius. My wife's, maybe not. <laughs> Safari can't open the page. Come on, Safari, do your thing. I'm gonna talk and then I can send the, uh, send the PowerPoint with the beautiful pictures of. Perfect, yeah. Uh, of, our, of our beautiful city to you. Good, thank you. Hi, Commissioners. Thank you uh, for being here and listening today. Um, I'm here to offer a view from the, from the hinterlands as a 14-year resident of Lentz. And as a parent and as someone who moved to Portland because it was a city of opportunity and as a city of, yes, we can, uh, the storied city that works. And I'm here in hopes that you in your final years as city bureau directors can guide your bureau staff to break through the barriers they've developed to get Portland working again and create a machine that the new, bureau, the new uh, city government system can be proud of and can hit the ground running in two years. I get that there are a lot of moving parts in any machine as complicated as Portland city government. I'm here to ask for your attention to a few areas that are opportunities for improvement. The first is registration for Portland parks and recreation activities. As many of you know, parks activities now require, uh, now offer priority registration to certain community groups in an effort to advance equity within the park system. The downside of that is that almost all activities are full by the time registration for the public at large begins. In 2019, my daughter, who is seven, started and was four at the time, five, I don't know. That was the before times. She started the penguin level of swim lessons in Portland Parks and Recreation. She did not advance through to the next level. Since then, we've managed to get her into another round of Portland Parks and Recreation penguin lessons, but again, she didn't advance. But round after round of trying to get her into swim lessons we, that we are paying for through the levy, and they are already full before registration even begins. She's currently number 27 on the wait list for the uh, lessons that start next week. Um, and of course, it's not just swim lessons. 
sports camps, cooking classes, you name it. Your best hope as a parent is to get your kid on a wait list because the city pre-registers kids for activities and they fill up before registration begins. A reasonable city, a city that works, might set aside half the slots for the general public to uh, go after as soon as registration opens up so that we have a decent chance of using the programs that the levy pays for. Uh, almost all the activities are instead full. Um, my second and third asks are for the Transportation Bureau. Um, I walk my kid to school most mornings, a six block walk to Lent Elementary, including a treacherous walk across Herald Street. The intersection uh, has a marked crosswalk, it's in a school zone, but drivers still blaze through there at 30 miles per hour or more, ignore the crosswalk, and generally act like idiots. The other day, a driver passed me on the right uh, in the bike lane in the school zone doing at least 50 miles per hour and admittedly after he passed me I sped up to 40 to figure out and then, yeah he was still going past me so it, it was definitely over 50. Um, I contacted 823-SAFE and asked uh, that they look into this and I know in Portland we don't like to think about enforcement as a solution we like to think about engineering as a solution and Peabot said there's no engineering solution here there's nothing we can do it's as safe as we can make it so what's left? You know, is there an enforcement option? It seemed fitting that as PBOC continues to engineer its way to Vision Zero and the city continues to shy its way away from using enforcement as a tool to get drivers to act responsibly, the result is more traffic, more congestion, and more people driving recklessly and tragically uh, to the most pedestrian deaths since 1948. Parks registration is not the only perpetual thank you for holding moment one experiences here. It's been 11 months now since the street sweepers came through my neighborhood. I'm a little obsessive about this because I don't, uh, I just want the pine needle needles swept out of the gutters and curb cuts on the kids' walk to school. So I watch the calendar on Peabot's website uh, to see when we're due for our sweeping. We were set in October, but then the leaf day schedule began. And that meant the neighborhoods that have the tree canopies instead of the heat islands got the two extra sweet street sweepings in the fall while we waited. Our system here is comically inefficient there's no notice to neighbors that sweeping is about to happen, no towing of abandoned cars, no temporary no parking signs set up on the sidewalks. If a bunch of cars are parked on the street on sweep day, two years of grime can build up, and you'll see a picture of this in the presentation, um, and, and the gutter before cleaning, and then who knows, maybe that car will still be there. Cities like Washington or even Las Vegas have regular weekly or biweekly street sweeping. I could talk about how frustrating it is to see pickleball courts going into Laurelhurst when the tennis court at Lentz Park looks like a cross between the Ho Rainforest uh, Hall of Mosses and yet simultaneously also the salt flats at Death Valley because it's so cracked. Um, or, uh, or, or, you know. And I'm, I'm sorry, I've let you go pretty okay, far. I'll, I will wrap up. Wrap it up because it, it, it's good testimony and I wanted I, I, to hear I it. Appreciate I was going to ask a question to precipitate quick. the rest. But, um, yeah. this, is a, this is a generational opportunity. You want to leave whatever is next. You want to leave the next system. You want to leave your city manager with a well-oiled machine. You want to leave them with something great, something to build on. And it's on you as bureau directors in the next two years to make fine-tuned improvements and systemic improvements for, uh, so that we can have um, a mantra that will last a generation again, um, ensure once again that we are a city that works. Good. Thank, so thank you. you. And, and uh, colleagues, thank you for your forbearance. I, I let you go a little longer because you, you were giving man. very, very specific recommendations and suggestions, and, and uh, I, really I think it, it behooves us all to hear them. So Thanks. thank you. Thanks for being here. Next individual, please, item number 221. Two, Request of Chris Reed to address council regarding update on Southwest Capitol Highway Rose Lane project. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning, Commissioner. Welcome. My name is Chris Reed. I manage commercial property in Hillsdale and represent the Hillsdale Business and Professional Association. I come to you today to give you an update on the Capitol Highway Rose Lane project. When the project was slated to be installed in Hillsdale, several pieces were missing and overlooked in Peabot's assessment of its Im impact prior to construction. Peabot did not research the impact of the Rose Lane on Hillsdale businesses. Peabot misapplied a report by two PSU professors showing no greenhouse effect installing the Rose Lane on flat parts of Portland. Hillsdale is not flat. It has one mile of 5.5% upgrade with stop and go traffic at peak hours. The project was based on pre-COVID traffic counts, traffic counts that do not currently, um, that currently do not exist because of COVID. Uh, when and if that will happen, no one knows. 
PBOT predicted no benefit from the project, yet the $200,000 Rose Lane was installed. PBOT predicted traffic diverting from Hillsdale due to the project, which means loss of potential sales, which has happened. The Rose Lane project may work in some grid pattern areas in Portland, but in Hillsdale, with no grid, with non-grid, approximately 850 feet of landlocked parking, the design does not work. Paloma Clothing, 2022 winner of Willamette Week's Best Clothing Boutique, reports 11% decline in sales and less foot traffic in the fourth quarter of 2022. Not even a 47-year-old Hillsdale business could withstand the negative effects of the Rose Lane on customers. Imagine what it's doing to younger businesses. Jason Crump, Portland Camera Service, reports sales are down 18% from this time last year. Brian Ochoa of Casa Clima Mexican Restaurant, 20 years in Hillsdale, shares that frustrated late drivers are using the new red lanes as their personal speed zones. When a person needs to turn right to cross the red lane to reach the businesses, they risk getting hit by a driver speeding through. Any business owner will tell you it's extremely difficult to get customers into the store and keep them returning, but it doesn't take much to lose them. The Rose Lane is causing business to lose, to lose both business and revenue. One business commented, there has been a measurable amount of damage done to our customer base. Businesses cannot make it solely on the strong local community that Hillsdale is fortunate to have. If the Rose Lane is not removed, Hillsdale will be left with a bad reputation of being way too confusing to drive to, causing people to stop coming from different areas of Portland. Which, uh, how much loss of business need is needed for Peabot how much loss to business do businesses need to experience before PDOT will, st will step in and address the situation? Please stop the negative impact on Hillsdale business and neighborhoods and remove the Capital Highway program. Thank you. Appreciate your being here today. And, and we, you, we heard similar testimony, I think, last week. Was it from Don? Don yeah. Don? And yeah. you guys got my packet. Yes. There's a picture in there of the um, eastbound yeah, Capitol we, Highway, which sure. shows the, with that red tag, and it shows the line that's causing people not to want to go to the south side where this business loss is occurring. Great. Thank you. Appreciate yeah. your being here today. Thank you. Uh, next individual, please, item number 22. Request of Fatima Magadimova to address council regarding Southeast Division Street safety. Welcome, Fatima. Um, uh, good morning, Fatima Magadimova, owner of Roman Russian Food Store. Um, uh, congratulations to newly elected Commissioner Gonzalez. Um, I want to start that it is time for us to have a reality that the engineering on Division Street is flawed. And now I want to show you a video what happens when you put form over function. Um, I want to see if everyone can see what I have here. Yeah, we see it. Um, so driver got confused and was driving in the bicycle lane thinking it was a traffic lane and this flipped driver's car over the concrete barrier. I wanna show it again, right here. We have a concrete right here that car went all over that concrete barrier, flipped over and landed 40 feet upside down in front of my store. My employee was outside and he rushed to the car to release two people that were trapped inside. Now look at the emergency vehicles. Because of the medians, they had to go to Division Street in the wrong direction to access the accident scene. And this is another problem with medians, that emergency vehicles cannot easily and safely get access. Do you see? So um, it is time we put function over form and remove median in front of our store replacing it with the left turn that PBOT said is doable, but was rejected because it does not meet their project goals. Videos that you just saw, it's a short list of problems that just in the front of my store. And we have them all over Division Street. Emergency vehicles obstructed, drivers confused, cars flipping over. 
going forward, let's put function over form, such as putting function over aesthetics. We, the Division Street business owners, deserve repairs to be made to unsafe conditions created by PBOT. Thank you so much. Thank you, Fatima. It's good seeing you. Happy New Year to you. Happy New Year. Can I just ask? Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Fatima, one sec. Uh, well, Commissioner Ryan. Did, Fatima, did you mention, is the driver okay? Like. Yes, driver okay. and passenger were okay. We got to them in time. Um, my employee, he's a Ukrainian refugee. He was outside cleaning. He ran to the car. He got both out. He could not speak English. He was asking, are you okay? Are you okay? When everyone else were calling uh, 911. Okay, thank you. I just needed to know. Thank you, Commissioner, Commissioner Gonzalez. Uh, Fatima, I just want to thank you for testifying today. Uh, on the campaign trail, we certainly heard from East Portlanders deep concerns about transportation policy, unintended consequences on neighborhoods and business communities, uh, learning more about the Hillsdale project, and I just hope as we go forward, we take into account the real concerns in many of our neighborhoods in the city of Portland on these complex transportation policy trade-offs. Thank you. Thank you Thanks, so much. Commissioner Maps. Uh, why don't we hear from Robert and then uh, I'll chime in. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. You probably want to hear from I'm sorry, from who? Uh, the next, next testimony. Next I think we're oh, I see. Testimony on the same talk. subject. Oh, got it. Okay, great. Item number 23, please. Request of Robert Butler to address council regarding Southeast Division Street safety. Welcome, Robert. Welcome, uh, commissioners and uh, a mayor for our new year. Um, well, you can guess I'm going to talk about safety. I'm going to talk about the Vision Street project. And kind of to begin with, an obscene amount of money was spent on Division, $185 million. And Peabot and TriMet are both responsible for what's ended up as a disaster. Um, the trans the Public Transportation Commission, you know, those volunteers in Salem, they gave Peabot $80 million to redo divisions, 82nd Avenue Street. God help us. This works, this $80 million works out at $2,000 per lineal foot. You can practically build light rail for $2,000. So Mr. Mayor, uh, Honorable Mayor, I, you know I respect you, I hope so anyway. For you, I say that you should reorganize the commission's counselor's job such that either you divide this Peabot debacle organization in half or in some way, but you got to lighten the load from this hole that, you, that we have seen dug by Peabot. So either divide it, look at the organization chart and divide out the CRT and all, a lot of other stuff and so that the new commissioner can focus on that. If you don't do that, at least a lighten his load otherwise, because you have given him mission impossible. So let me give you an example of mission that's impossible. Starting in October, first city council meeting, after three, I told the city council, we're responsible for possible uh, death to drivers if you don't put up a no left turn sign where you put up a median and if you turn left on 109th, you're going up division on the wrong direction. That's your, your only choice. It took weeks, probably six weeks before, sit, before the city put up a sign. That's unexcusable safety. I just kid you not. Well, let's just say that uh, Peabot had another serious omission. And that is the, the design of their safety projects were to ignore the problems created to trucking. I'm telling you there is, that is unacceptable for a transportation commission. What we need to do is fix the mistakes we made and make the organizational changes such that we have people that are competent and we no longer have the incompetent people. And I hope we can all work together enthusiastically and make progress and good luck. Thank you. Thank you. And, and Robert, just um, so you're aware under the city charter, I am able to assign bureaus 
but I cannot split the bureaus. That would have to be done by an ordinance of the council, and so that would have to be done at the recommendation of the commissioner in charge. But I'm, I'm always open to my colleagues' thoughts uh, about how we can better manage the overall enterprise, and I appreciate your testimony today as always, but I just wanted you to be aware of that, uh, that I'm very, small, I'm very small much aware legal of that. issue. <laughs> I'm very much aware of that, and let's, let's do it. All right, thank you, sir. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Commissioner Maps. Sure. Um, I just wanted to weigh in here and um, recognize uh, um, the testimony that we've heard today, especially around issues uh, concerning PBOT. As uh, many people know, I uh, inherited the PBOT portfolio about 11 days ago. I am honored and excited about the opportunities that uh, are presented here. Uh, many of the issues that have been raised today have been floating around for a while. Um, I pledge to you that I will engage with them and I will engage with you around these issues. Um, it will take a little bit of time, though. Um, I think I'm a week and a half into this game. Uh, there are lots of moving pieces here, um, but I am deeply committed to building infrastructure which is robust and equitable. Um, and um, I invite you to reach out directly to my office uh, um, if you have specific concerns moving forward. And uh, you should expect um, announcements uh, um, from me, from my office in the coming weeks and days, uh, which move our city forward um, in terms of building an efficient um, and equitable transportation system. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Maps. <laughs> And our last individual for communications today, item number 24, please. Request of Amber Barnes to address council regarding nuisance property in Kenton neighborhood. Welcome, Amber. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Um, I'm a resident of the Kenton neighborhood in North Portland, and I'm here today along with several of my neighbors um, to ask for your attention and action in helping us restore peace and safety to our neighborhood and the Kenton Community Garden. PPB's North Precinct will be submitting 2723 North Houghton Street as a chronic nuisance property to the city attorney's office this month, pursuant to city code. We implore you to work swiftly to authorize the city attorney to commence legal proceedings to abate this chronic nuisance to the fullest extent possible under law. It is clear to our neighborhood that the residents of this property have no intention of taking action to improve conditions and have no concern for their neighbors or the safety of our community. For years, the residents near our block have been unable to live with any sense of safety or security due to the actions of the residents of this property and the people they allow to visit and live on and around the house. The owner of this house died in 2020, and her relatives have yet to initiate the probate process and are instead using this property as a hub for a myriad of criminal and nuisance activities. Since my partner and I moved in next door to this property a year ago, we have made calls and online reports to almost all city agencies, been awoken in the middle of the night to explosions, screaming, fighting, banging, and most alarming gunshots, opened our doors to find police with canine units chasing a carjacking suspect through our yard, finding them hiding out at this property. Neighbors found a firearm discarded by a resident of this property in their bushes, and another resident hiding from the police in a neighbor's garage. Recent media reports show that since 2018, over 300 911 calls have been made because of this property. Gardeners showing up to care for their plots have been harassed and have had their access blocked by stolen vehicles and campers associated with this property. It is exhausting, it is traumatizing, and it is a drain on our neighborhood and our city resources. It took several months of all of us making regular phone calls to 311 and online reporting to PDX Reporter for PBOT with a required PPB escort to finally tag and remove several cars, trailers, and RVs from our block that were associated with this property and constituted a growing issue that included the dumping of raw sewage into our street on multiple occasions. All of this has reached a dangerous tipping point, one we fear that is going to continue to escalate and result in people being severely injured or even killed. Since the cars and trailers were tagged and towed at the end of December, the two neighbors directly across the street from this property have had their bedroom windows and car windows shot out in retaliation while children were asleep inside the home. This property more than meets the requirements for a public nuisance designation. 
I know you recently reorganized the bureaus in part to streamline livability and safety concerns like this, and that's good news because we've done all that we can as a neighborhood and as responsible community members. We've worked with associations, bureaus, and first responders for years, and now it's time for the city to act. There's so much more that will not fit into this three minutes, and we would appreciate a follow-up from the mayor's office, Commissioner Ryan, and anyone else who is able to help us. Yeah, uh, uh, first of all, thank you for your testimony. Thank you all for being here today, and I look forward to helping you with this. And I also wanna thank you for the time you took to document this through the 311 system. That documentation from the community is critically important because there are constitutional thresholds the city has to make as a public agency with regard to private property and taking and all of that. Um, so that, that was, I'm sure, a pain from your perspective, but it was critically important to be able to do that. Uh, and yeah, we will look forward to following up with you on the next steps. Thank you very and, much. And uh, is, is Bobby here? He just walked out. We'll, we'll make sure we My follow up. My contact information was on the packet that I cool. sent. Cool, yeah, we've got it. Thank you for Thank being you. here. Thanks all of you for being here today. We appreciate it. That completes our communications. Uh, have any items been pulled off of the consent agenda? We've received no requests. Please call the roll. Rubio? Um, aye. Ryan? Aye. Gonzalez? Aye. Maps? Aye. Wheeler? Aye. Consent aye. agenda is adopted. First time certain item, number 25, a proclamation. Proclaim the second week of January 2023 to be Slavic and Eastern European Heritage Week. Colleagues, this is the sixth annual proclamation celebrating Slavic and Eastern European Heritage Week here in the city of Portland. This year, the proclamation will be read in both English and Russian. The city is proud of its relationships with the local Slavic and Eastern European communities. It's a continued goal of the city of Portland to build a diverse and inclusive workforce, and I'm very proud to co-sponsor this proclamation. I'd also like to invite my co-sponsor on this proclamation, Commissioner Maps, to say a few words of introduction as well. Commissioner uh, Maps. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Colleagues, it's an honor to join you in proclaiming the second week of January 2023 to be Slavic and Eastern European Heritage Week. Uh, before we turn to today's presentation, I'd like to take a moment to share some thoughts on why Slavic and Eastern European Heritage Week is important to the city of Portland. Um, now, there are many reasons to celebrate the contributions Slavic and Eastern European uh, communities have made to our city. Uh, we could talk about the contributions our Slavic and Eastern European neighbors have made to Portland's culture, or we could celebrate the contributions Portland Slavic and Eastern European communities have made to our city's economy. And we could also honor the contributions Portland Slavic and Eastern European communities have made to our city's cultural life. But this year and today, when I reflect upon the moral meaning of Slavic and Eastern European Heritage Week, I return to a different theme. This year, Slavic and Eastern European Heritage Week resonates with me because this moment reminds all of us that just as the United States is a nation of immigrants, Portland is also a city of immigrants. Today, around 50,000 Slavic immigrants live in the Portland metro area. The first wave of Slavic immigrants arrived in Oregon in the 1960s and settled around Woodburn, Oregon, where they tended to take up farming. A second wave of Slavic immigrants arrived in Oregon in the 1980s. Uh, these folks came to Portland seeking religious freedom, and they tended to settle in East Portland, especially around the Foster, Powell, and Gateway neighborhoods. Our Slavic and Eastern European neighbors have been a driving force behind e East Portland's resiliency and renaissance. And as Portland recovers from the social and economic wounds caused by COVID, our city needs our Slavic and Eastern European communities' ingenuity, innovation, and partnership more than ever. Colleagues, that's why I'm glad that this council is taking a moment to remember and recognize the contributions our Slavic and Eastern European neighbors have made to the city of Portland. And that's why, and that's what Slavic and Eastern European Heritage Week is all about. 
Here today to tell us more about Slavic and Eastern European Heritage Week, we have Svetlana Hedin, a founding member of the City of Portland's Slavic Empowerment Team. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. Happy New Year. Welcome, uh, Commissioner Gonzalez. Uh, my name is Svetlana Hedin. Uh, I'm here as a founding member, member of the Slavic Empowerment Team and a co-chair of the Slavic Advisory Council. Slavic Empowerment Team is part of the Diverse Empowered Employees of Portland. Um, this is our sixth annual proclamation, just like T Mayor Ted Wheeler said, and um, we are proud to take a moment to honor and uplift members of Slavic and Eastern European community living in the greater Portland area. We are here um, to give a voice and recognition to this unique and beautiful culture that makes our city more diverse and empowered. I would like to recognize Irene Konev, who used to work for the city, uh, who was the inspiration and instrumental leader to identify that there was no proclamation for our Slavic community. Um, she gathered our community to walk us through um, the formation of this proclamation back in 2017. Um, I also would like to thank Tamara Burkovskaya for translating the proclamation into a Russian language for us and also would like to recognize Ted Nayamura to ste for stepping up and being the co-chair of Slavic Empowerment Team when the need was great. Um, today we have two speakers that are going to share their stories. First one is um, Aggie um, Modern, uh, currently is a, an MA student in PSU book publishing program. She is originally from Hungary and she has studied Russian and Hungary in school when it was a required subject, and recently she has came to, back to learning Russian, taking upper division classes at PSU in the Russian program. Aggie, are you with us? Yes, I am. Awesome. Good morning. Can you hear me and see yep, me? Yep, loud and clearly. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Aggie Body Modern, and I've been living in Portland for 15 years. I'm originally from Hungary, where I lived until I was 20 years old. It was definitely the era of goulash socialism, but I like to refer to it as soft communism. I first came to the United States as an au pair shortly after the Iron Curtain fell in 1989. This was a very big deal because during my entire life, Hungarians, including my family, could only leave the country once every three years uh, using our heavily monitored passports. As a young adult, I embarked on my journey and arrived in California, a place where I stayed for one year and I honed my language skills. I returned to Hungary, never thinking that I would ever end up coming back, let alone live here for more than three decades. But life had other plans for me, so I did return, and soon after that, I met my husband. In a nutshell, we lived in the Bay Area for 17 years before moving to Oregon, where we continue to raise our three children in a bilingual household. I'm very proud to say that I have never spoken an English word to my children, and as of today, they all speak, read, and write in Hungarian too. My husband, not so much. Uh, my life revolves around my family, travel, and literature. I work as an emerging literary translator, and translating has become my passion over the past five years. I spend most of my days weaving words together to make it possible for an English speaking audience to read Hungarian books. If you'd like any book recommendations, feel free to reach out to me. When I was a child, I read voraciously and I also had to learn Russian because Hungary was under Russian occupation until the fall of the Iron Curtain. Fast forward 30 years and my Russian language skills deteriorated a lot. It has always been a dream of mine to return to a language that played such a vital part of my growing up. So three years ago, I began taking classes and I am currently enrolled in my third year Russian classes at PSU. I'm very lucky to be able to travel back and forth between Hungary and the United States and enjoy both of my cultures from a native point of view, a native's point of view. I love going to theatrical performances, museums, and all sorts of cultural events to broaden my horizon. 
I also enjoy meeting people from all over the world. And that is why I'm honored that you all listen to my personal story. Thank you for having me today. Thank you, Aggie. We, we have the second speaker who is here with us today. Uh, her name is uh, Alene Bilik, and um, she's originally from Ukraine and is an active acti activity coordinator at the Immigrant and Refugee Community Organization, short IRCO. Hello. Hi. I am very honored to be here and speak to you. Let me introduce myself. My name is Olena Bilk, and uh, I am a refugee from Ukraine. I came from my country five years ago when the war broke out in eastern Ukraine. In Ukraine, I have two higher education degrees. The first one, I am a medical doctor. I have 17 years working as an oncologist. My second degree is in psychology. As a psychologist, I work as a director of the charitable foundation for orphan children and internal refugee families in eastern Ukraine. I loved my jobs and I was a successful professional woman. When I came here to the USA in 2013, I faced all the difficulties the refugees face in a new country. I am a single mom, and uh, I have to provide for my two sons uh, and uh, elderly mother. I worked several jobs and went to college to improve my English. Life was very challenging, but I managed to overcome uh, all the challenges. I got a lot of moral and financial help from DHS and IRCO. Due to the support I got in this country and using my education and experience from Ukraine, I start working at IRCO. Right now, the situation in Ukraine is hard because of the war and many people have to leave their homes and the country. They came to this country to find a safe refuge. It's okay. Take your time. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I don't want to hit her in the face. <laughs> all, all of them need as much support as they can get. I have a great opportunity to support refugees to adapt to live life in the USA. Many people were thankful saying that we helped them to get the start for a new safe life here. Therefore, I am grateful to you for supporting refugees and immigrants in Portland and for supporting my community. I'd like to emphasize that uh, it would be imp imp impossible without your support. Only working together, we can stop the war, establish peace, and overcome the devastation it brought to many people. Let's work for peace. Thank you for your time and attention. Sorry. Absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, Elena, thank you thank for your you. heartfelt comments. It, it brings it home for all of us, and we appreciate your being here. And thank you, Agi, and thank you, Svetlana, for, for your leadership as well. We appreciate it. It's now my honor to read the proclamation, but before I do that, I wanted to ask any of my colleagues if they had any further comments they'd like to make prior to my reading. Very good. Uh, actually, uh, Commissioner Ryan? Sorry. Yeah, I just want to say Yeah, please. Things. Um, I just want to acknowledge your leadership, first of all. Um, Thank you. So, so I want to say your name right. Svetlana. Svetlana, yeah. You're, you're quite a force here in the city. That's a positive statement. <laughs> and Thank you. Um, it's my third one, and you always bring um, really compelling stories. And 
I have all these comments, but what's more important is to listen to the stories. And your story is, each story is unique. Um, but there's so many immigrants that I've met in my life that come here with so many skill sets and credentials. And then the survival that you've gone through with raising your children and taking care of your mom and the three jobs. And then how you're showing up to serve today to be um, there for those who you're, you're helping with adoptions. So I'll always remember your testimony today. And it just brings who am I in Portland, Oregon to really understand what's going on in Ukraine. But I can do my best by listening to people that are on the front lines that are actually doing something. So I really appreciate you being here today. And also to the student who spoke, um, the master's student. And I just say my own personal experience with that is um, I was in a relationship for 11 years with a Russian scholar and we used to go to parties of states me back when uh, it was all crumbling. It was in the late 80s in Brighton Beach, part of um, New York City. And I just always was so welcome. But I was, I guess, the person that, uh, I, I was the person that didn't speak Russian. But everyone was so warm. There was like vodka everywhere and, um, and all sorts of food and everyone was so friendly. And I had no idea what anyone was saying. But, but, which is kind of comforting, um, but they, they were also um, welcoming and kind. And I just saw the resilience and the excitement that they were in our country. And like all immigrants, those are the new micro economies that have always made our, our country successful. It's that innovation and creativity and resilience and grit that, that immigrants bring, the new that. arrivals bring to our country. And that's why we've always been the strongest democracy in the world. And if we don't continue to always embrace that spirit and include it, then we have nothing. That's our, real, that's our real strength. So thank you for being a backbone of that strength, not only for this community, but a good story for our country to always listen to. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Commissioner Rubio. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to echo um, the uh, appreciation from my colleagues here. Um, thank you so much, Svetlana, for your leadership here, and um, Elena for your story, and Aggie as well. Um, very, very compelling. Um, and, uh, you know, these proclamations just happen once a year, but it really reminds us, like, we can't forget. We can't forget all the other days of the year that these are, these things are happening in real time. These communities are contributing every day. And um, your, your, contri your communities are contributing so much to Portland, civically, culturally, economically. Um, and it's because of uh, these contributions that it makes who Portland is becoming and we're becoming better for it. Um, it's also important because it reminds us about the reality and the, the heartbreak and the challenges and devastations that families are still experiencing because of the war. And we can't forget that. We need to remember that every day as well. And so I am honored that you're sharing your stories um, and, and because of your courage. Um, as a daughter and granddaughter of Mexican immigrants, um, I also see and recognize the resiliency and pride in your culture um, and the leadership in your culture and in your community. Um, and so I just want to say thank you for that. Thank you, Commissioner Rubio. Good. All right, very good. So I'm going to read it in English, and then Svetlana, you're going to read it in Russian for us. Thank you. Whereas, Slavic and Eastern European Americans are one of Portland's largest immigrant and refugee communities, with over 150,000 people in the greater Portland area. And whereas, Slavic and Eastern European Portlanders can trace their ancestry to 15 countries of the former Soviet Union and 14 Eastern European countries with unique languages, dialects, cultures, and histories. And whereas, the city of Portland has many Slavic and Eastern European employees and a Slavic empowerment team that works to build a more inclusive and diverse workforce. And whereas, the Slavic empowerment team shares culture, language, and art with city employees through celebrations, displays, performances. And whereas, the Slavic empowerment team collaborates with many diverse organizations in the greater Portland area. And whereas, the city of Portland strongly aligns with international concerns as to hostilities, loss of life, and suffering in regions such as Eastern Europe and countries like Ukraine. And whereas, Portland is a welcoming, inclusive, and sanctuary city that celebrates its growing diversity. 
and Whereas. The city of Portland is proud of its relationships with all members of the Slavic and Eastern European community and will continue supporting their professional and economic advancement. Now, therefore, I, Ted Wheeler, Mayor of the City of Portland, Oregon, the City of Roses, do hereby proclaim the second week of January 2023 to be Slavic and Eastern European Heritage Week in Portland and encourage all residents to celebrate this week. Thank you. Svetlana. Thank you. Поскольку американцы славянского и восточноевропейского происхождения являются одной из самых больших общин иммигрантов и беженцев Портленда, насчитывающие более 150 тысяч человек, которые проживают в Портленде и его окрестностях. И поскольку портландцы славянского и восточноевропейского происхождения своими корнями уходят в 15 стран бывшего Советского Союза, и 14 восточного восточноевропейских стран с их уникальными языками, диалектами, культурой и историей. И поскольку в городской управе Портленда трудятся много сотрудников славянского и восточноевропейского происхождения, и есть славянская инициативная группа, которая формулирует более инклюзивный и разнообразный рабочий коллектив, и поскольку славянская инициативная группа продвигает культуру, язык и искусство среди сотрудников городского, городской управы путем проведения праздничных мероприятий, выставок и представлений. И поскольку славянская инициативная группа сотрудничает с многочисленными разнообразными организациями в Портленде и его окрестностях, и поскольку городская группа, городская управа Портленда однозначно разделяет международную озабоченность по поводу военных действий, гибели и страданий людей в таких регионах, как Восточная Европа и таких стран, как Украина. И поскольку Портленд – это гостеприимный, инклюзивный город-убежище, где, где чувствует растущее разнообразие, и поскольку городская управа Портленда гордится своими отношениями со своими членами славянской и восточноевропейской общины и продолжит оказание поддержки их профессиональному и экономическому продвижению. Поэтому я, Тед Уиллер, мэр города Портленда, штат Орегон, города Роуз, настоящим провозглашаю вторую неделю января 2023 года неделей славянского и восточноевропейского наследия в Портленде и призываю всех жителей отмечать эту неделю. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all of you. Appreciate this so much. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Next up, uh, we have our second time certain item today, item number 26. 2022 Steve Lowenstein Trust Award. Commissioner Maps. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Colleagues, today I have the honor of introducing this year's Steve Lowenstein Trust Award presentation. Of course, this award was named after Steve Lowenstein. Lowenstein served as Portland City Commissioner Mike Lindbergh's Chief of Staff. In 1990, Steve was stricken with cancer and died at the age of 52. While we still mourn Steve's death, we also still celebrate his life. Lowenstein was a gifted public servant and a champion of social justice. Uh, Steve endowed this award in his will. According to Steve's will, this award should be given annually to, quote, that person who demonstrated the greatest contribution to assisting the poor and underprivileged in the city of Portland, Oregon. Every year, this award is presented at a meeting of the Portland City Council. Today, we are gathered for the 31st presentation of the Lowenstein Award. This year's award winner is Eric Knotts. A four, here we go. A, 
Of course, Eric is an Oregon State basketball star who has dedicated his life to mentoring and coaching BIPOC youth, especially in East Portland. Here today to present this year's award, we have some members of the Board of Trustees from the Lowenstein Trust, including Michelle Harper and Joe Hertzberg and our Adrian Livingston. Uh, welcome, um, uh, welcome to our distinguished panel. Um, thank you for being here today. Thank you. Mayor and Commissioners, uh, I'm gonna just take a minute to talk about Steve Lowenstein because I don't think any of you knew him personally. Uh, Steve was an am amazing person and had an amazing career for someone who died at just 52. Uh, could you do the first slide, please? Uh, he worked in the earliest days of the Peace Corps and with Ford Foundation in Ethiopia and Chile. He founded the Oregon Law Center and the Oregon Law Foundation. He wrote the definitive history of Jews in Oregon. And for the last six years of his life, he was Mike Lindbergh's chief of staff. He was trusted in City Hall as a straight shooter, a consensus builder, and a passionate advocate for social justice. All these years after his death, Steve's influence is still felt. Uh, my guess is that every one of you has people in key leadership positions in your bureaus who consider Steve to be a mentor and a role model. When Steve died, he endowed a trust fund to annually recognize, in his words, that person who demonstrated the greatest contribution to assisting the poor and underprivileged in the city of Portland. Uh, could you put the second slide up, please? This year, we're presenting the Steve Lowenstein Award for the 31st time. Could we see that slide? Second slide? Yeah, there we go. Uh, every one of these awards has been done in Portland City Council Chambers. Um, Eric joins a distinguished group of local heroes, many of them unsung. It's been an honor and a privilege to give them just a bit of the recognition that they deserve. You will certainly recognize some of these names, but you might not have when they receive the award. Selecting the honoree is the most humbling and rewarding thing I do all year, along with my fellow trustees. I'd like to mention them. Uh, here today are Adrian Livingston, Art Alexander, Jamal Folsom, Margie Harris, and Michelle Harper um, called in sick this morning and is missing this presentation for the first time out of all of these 31 years. I think she may be the only one with perfect attendance. Um, other trustees are Monica Garaki, Mark Jolin, Paul Kelly, Charlie Williamson, Polo Catalani, Shelley Romero, and Xavier Pierce. Um, Adrian herself was the 2018 recipient of the award, and she'll now introduce today's honoree, Eric Knox. So, uh, Mayor, Commissioners, on behalf of the Lowenstein Trustees, I am thrilled that I personally get to present this award, this 31st Steve Lowenstein Award to Eric Knox. He's someone that I personally know. I have seen his work through decades, and um, what he does, he doesn't do to be on the stage front. He doesn't do it to be in the spotlight. He does it because he knows it impacts this community. When he sees injustices, he, hi he vocalizes it loudly. So as the person who nominated him said many things about his work, I want to highlight this one uh, quote from her. Eric has lived his whole life advocating for the black, indigenous, and people of color communities. There is not a day that goes by where he is not speaking up for equality or justice for his neighbors, unapologetically. That is Eric. Um, he exemplifies living a life that makes a difference for the underserved. So I wanna tell you a little bit about some of his work, because obviously three minutes can't incorporate all of it. Um, in the 90s, he bought a home on Northeast 6th and Shaver where he started his first nonprofit, Urban Progress. 
His vision was to become a beacon of hope and support to black men struggling with the crossroads of gang violence and drugs and helping them see another way out. And we know in the 90s, the drug epidemic was large. He did that. Present day, Eric founded Holla Mentors, a campus-based program based in East Portland where many members of black, brown, and indigenous communities live. Holla pairs students with mentors to serve as a positive role model, providing them with the support they need to be both safe and successful. Trained culturally responsive mentors cultivate trusting relationships with family members and engage school representatives and the broader community who surround students, helping them stay on a positive path to a brighter future. Eric also founded Holla Charter School in partnership with Reynolds School District. Eric, his work rewrites the narrative of black, brown, and indigenous youth by honoring their lived experience and unlocking, um, unlocking opportunities to realize their full potential. And that is a beautiful thing. So Eric, we, the Lowenstein trustees, are so honored to award you the 31st Steve Annual Lowenstein Award. Thank you, appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm truly honored, Mayor, Commissioner, um, to receive this award. Um, you can't do this work I have found without a therapist. <laughs> you can't be in this work without a therapist. And uh, I, you know, you spend your time figuring out how you got here, why you're driven to this kind of work. I, serve black, brown, and indigenous kids in East County that have been pushed out of inner north and northeast Portland because of gentrification and other historic reasons. And um, <clears throat> as I was talking to my therapist, my, I had a pretty traumatic past. I grew up uh, with some very tough circumstances. I grew up in South LA and uh, grew up in a broken home and uh, I had to navigate a lot and had to grow myself up without a lot of parental supervision. And uh, I was talking to my therapist, my therapist, um, I, was, I said, why, I don't understand why I'm driven to this work, why like, I'm so passionate about, I, I get up in the morning and it's as easy as putting my socks on. Like I, this is, I think about this work. And he says, well, it makes sense because you're an orphan. And he goes, orphans understand orphans. And, um, that's been my work. Like, I serve a population of kids that have been orphaned, um, that have not been considered or represented uh, in America's whitest mid-sized city. And uh, that has always been my work. Um, uh, I think of a girl who's eight years old. She's African-American. Every year in, in the spring, we interview our kids because we try and match them with mentors that look like them because we believe you can't be what you can't see. And so we try and match them with uh, adults that represent them in every way uh, and give them a, a gateway of opportunity to see what the, what the possibilities are. And so we were interviewing this African-American eight-year-old girl and we asked her a question. Uh, like we asked every kid, we can't match every kid, but we asked this girl, what do you want to be when you grow up? And her response was, I want to be myself. I want to be myself. And uh, I thought that was extremely intuitive because that's going to be the fight of her life as a young black girl in America trying to figure out who she is. I think of Ram Dass, a spiritual leader in the 60s, who said that part of our role as we engage each other is to help each other find our way home. And all of us in here wrestle with identity and home and place and what does it mean to be yourself fully and Hala is a culturally specific mentoring organization that is unapologetic serving black and brown kids who've been displaced uh, for various reasons in East County uh, to help them have a space that they can call home and that is our passion that is our heart that's what we do um, I'm reminded of one quick story and I'll end this. And it's a, I'm a storyteller, I love telling stories. That's how I communicate with my kids. Um, but 
Um, my mom and my grandparents, uh, my granddad is African American, my grandmother is Jewish. She, uh, she, she went to New York University um, and then my grandfather grew up in the housing tenements of, of Harlem in the 30s. And, you know, one of eight children in a very poor part of the city. But he had a writing skill and he ended up getting a uh, scholarship to NYU. So he went to NYU at the same time my grandmother went to NYU. And they fell in love. They met and fell in love. You, you know, in the 30s, I mean, here's this black man marrying this, wanting to marry this Jewish woman in America. You can imagine there's only a few places in this country that you could get married. So they ended up moving to Mexico City because he was an educator and she was a prolific artist. In Mexico City, uh, my mom, being the oldest, um, was on a play date with one of her friends. And that person came, that dad came to pick up uh, my mom's friend uh, from this play date. And he happened to be a doctor. And, and so when my grandmother opened the door, he noticed a lump on her breast. And he told her, go get that checked out. It looks pretty serious. Ended up getting it checked out. Turned out that she had breast cancer. They gave her three months to live. She died in a month. <clears throat> At the funeral, a man gave my mom two paintings and said, your mom was an incredible artist. Uh, and I just put these, I, I made these paintings for her, and I hope you appreciate them because they represent the beauty and creativity of who she was. And my mom kept those paintings. And so we moved back to Inglewood. My, my mom and her uh, siblings moved back to Inglewood, California with her aunt, my, my grandfather's sister, because my grandfather uh, wanted to stay back in Mexico City and spend a few years grieving. So when they were in Inglewood, my grandfather got over the death of his wife. He moved back to LA with my mom. And my mom, you know, she grew up, met my dad, kept these paintings, put them on a wall. And to be honest, growing up as a child, I used to see these paintings. And my mom would talk about these paintings, but the paintings didn't have much meaning. And actually, they weren't that pretty. I get to Oregon State on a basketball scholarship. My mom and dad had broken up, and my, um, my, uh, my mom had fallen behind on her property. If you go to Inglewood, California, my mom is known in the city as Mother Teresa of Inglewood. I mean, <clears throat> my dad was a straight hustler. My mom had a big heart. She was in sort of nonprofit work. And I always say I get my hustle from my dad and my heart from my mom. And my mom would always organize community events and she would do big events and uh, have big dinners at her house. And uh, I'll, I'll wrap this up. To make a long story short, she was, she was behind on her property and uh, she was gonna do this event, but she was just struggling to pay her bills, but she decided to put this event on, have a leadership meeting, get everybody there. And uh, there was a guy who just moved in at the end of the block and he moved in and uh, my mom went down and invited him to the leadership meeting just to welcome him to the neighborhood. And so when he came down, my mom started showing him around his house and then he walked her by the two paintings and said, these two paintings were given to me from a man in Mexico City when my mom died. And uh, he looked down at the signature of the painting and the paintings were by Diego Rivera. I don't know if you know who Diego Rivera is, <laughs> I don't know if you understand the worth of those paintings, but my, my, the, the man happened to be an art appraiser. And he said, Claudia, that's her name, do you understand the worth of these paintings? And my mom had no clue who Diego Rivera was or the value of the painting. I always tease my mom. I said, what did you do when you knew the worth of the painting? She says, I took the painting, bought a gun, and put the paintings in my closet because she took one of the paintings to Bottoms and Buttersworth to sell one of them to change her life. And uh, she, she ended up taking one of those paintings to Bottom and Butterworth uh, on a Tuesday. When she found out the worth of the painting on a Friday, she took it on Tuesday, sold it, and it changed their financial circumstances, to say the least. And I always use this story because I always tell people that the work that we do uh, is like an art appraiser. We come alongside black, brown, and Native American kids because they don't assess the true value of their worth because they don't see it anywhere, media, education, um, the history even of our own city. And so I love to be in parts of town 
that where our kids who've been displaced to create a space for them to understand the beauty, value of who they are. And so receiving this award, I, I love hearing the story of Steve Lowenstein. I'm absolutely honored to be a part of this fraternity. And uh, thank you uh, for considering me for this prestigious award. Thank you. Well, thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Knox, uh, and congratulations. We, we appreciate it, and it's, it's almost like poetry hearing your story. Thank you for sharing it with all of us, and thank you again to all of you who are involved in the Lowenstein Trust, all the trustees, for, for making, once again, an exceptional choice. Commissioner Maps, I'll give you the last word on this. Um, actually, Mr. Mayor, um, I would suggest that we uh, break for a minute and take a picture with, the, um, uh, uh, with our distinguished guest. If you it's his reputation, sure, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Recording stopped. Recording in progress. And we'll go ahead and start recording. Very good. All right, we'll move to the regular agenda. The first item is item number 32. This is a second reading of a non-emergency ordinance. Amend intergovernmental agreement with the City of Lake Oswego to purchase property for replacement or expansion of the Tryon Creek wastewater treatment plant. Colleagues, this is a second reading. We have already heard a presentation and taken public testimony on this item. Is there any further business? Seeing none, please call the roll. Rubio? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Gonzalez? Aye. Maps? Aye. Wheeler? I appreciated the presentation last week. I thought it was very thorough and interesting. Commissioner Maps, thanks for your leadership. I vote aye. Ordinance is adopted. Next item is item number 33, also a second reading. Amend contract with JCI Jones Chemical to increase amount for bulk supply of sodium hydro, or sorry, hypochlorite. Any further discussion on this second reading? Please call the roll. Rubio? 
Aye. Ryan? Aye. Gonzalez? Aye. Maps? Aye. Wheeler? Aye. Ordinance is adopted and we are adjourned.